Hello. Today in the studio we have with us Mr. Stan Lee, who is the publisher of Marvel Comics. And today he's going to tell us a little bit about how he got started, and etc. Now, the Marvel Age began in 1961 with Fantastic Four. Is that correct? Right. That was our first book in the so-called Marvel Age of comics, which revolutionized all of literature, as we all know. How did you come up with this idea? Um, well, actually, it wasn't even an original idea. The fellow who was then the publisher said to me, I was the editor at the time and the head writer. That doesn't mean I wrote heads. I was the chief writer. Okay. And he said to me, you know, Stan, I found out that DC Comics has a book called The Justice League, and uh, it's selling pretty well. And maybe we ought to do a book with a lot of superheroes. So I figured, okay. So right away it started out as a copy, but I said, I'm not going to copy the Justice League. I never can remember it was the Justice League or the Justice Society. It was one of those. So I figured, okay, if we have to do a team, that's fine, but we're going to do it differently than anybody else does it. So instead of a lot of good guys who always won at the end and uh, they were brilliant and they were superior to the villains and they never did anything wrong, we came up with the Fantastic Four who inevitably did something wrong and they weren't really that much better than the bad guys and um, I would like to think that these stories were unexpected and you never knew what was going to happen next and that started all of this magnificence. Hey everyone ever, um, welcome, welcome to, and thank you I guess, I'm going to say thank you, I said welcome, but I mean thank you uh, for listening to this, a uh, special, um, extra bonus, what, unnumbered episode of a podcast, uh, 20th, 20th Century Pop is the normal name of the podcast, the show where we try to understand our present while living in our, our, our past, and I'm doing this right now on Monday, 5.04 p.m., um, probably about an hour and 25 minutes after reading the news. Um, Stan Lee, a name that anyone knows, a prolific comic book writer, comic book creator, comic book editor, comic book promoter, comic book fan, um, has passed away. <laughs> has passed away. He died today. He died at age 95, which is no young number. That's an impressive number to reach. Uh, many of the titles of characters he co-created never reached that number. <clears throat> but, um... And this happens, by the way. This this happens not often, thankfully, because the numbers of people passing are huge. But every now and then, every now and then, a name comes up in the news, in the obituaries, in, in, in a news break, an announcement that they've passed away. Which is, by the way, is what everybody does. <laughs> everybody dies. So we know that. And it's sad. It's sad, really, when anybody dies. But every now and then, uh, someone hits the news as passing and it's strange that that hits me um, because these are not people I know you know the people whose work I know whose creative endeavors I know um, and whose creative work I was enriched by when I was um, 14 14 years old was the first time I experienced this um, in 1990 when Jim Henson passed away. Muppet, puppeteer, writer and director of Dark Crystal, Labyrinth, so many Muppet sketches, Jim Henson. And I remember his passing. I remember it well. It, it was not something I would have thought about. And why would I have? He's, he's a, he, you know, I was a kid for one. And two, it's just, it's a creative person. Jim Henson's name is on all the stuff. Henson production, Jim Henson's the Muppets. There's Jim Henson. Now there he is too. Oh wait, that's Kermit the Frog, but they sound the same. It was just this understood arrested, developed magic. That is art where this person created work that is timeless and doesn't have to, obey the same laws of mortality as people. 
The difference here is this was a person who was alive in my lifetime, so Jim Henson, a persona who I saw on TV, who I saw occupy the space, who I saw interact in the world, who then had an end, as all people do, in my lifetime. And that struck and shook me. It was odd. It didn't seem right. Why would he die? He's this person who does these things. And what does it mean for the art? Eight years later, Phil Hartman from Saturday Night Live, and my favorite performer ever from Saturday Night Live, met an untimely end in a horrible story. And that seemed inhuman to me. That didn't seem right. That struck me. That was 1998. So it probably wasn't until, was it 2014 maybe, when um, one night while my partner and I were watching The Conjuring on DVD, I felt a strange uh, tumultuous knot in my stomach, probably because it's a horror movie. I uh, come to find out the next day that that night, that day, at some point at that day, Lou Reed had passed. The musician Lou Reed, whose music had introduced me to sensations and feelings with songs like Heroin and Romeo Had Juliet, he had passed on. And that shook me as well, because that's not someone I thought was immortal, but not even someone I thought was mortal, which leads leads us to the next death that I wasn't able to, 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 to process. David Bowie's in, what was that, 2015, maybe? 2016, I think it was 2016. I woke and read his passing, and that was difficult to understand because none of us thought he was human. So to think that he had left Earth, we thought, well, it's probably on a ship, right? Not, not via casket, burial, human demise. So I guess those are the three creative celebrity deaths that I didn't know how to, to process in my lifetime of 43 years. That's pretty fortunate because I didn't know any of these people. So what is that loss? What is that feeling? What is that sensation to lose these people? Well, I'm sure I've thought about it in the past. Maybe I've even spoken about it or written about it. So maybe you've even heard about it. But I mean, there's there's a lot of uh, complicated feelings and emotions and something like that. There's a lot of space for philosophy and art versus the artist. and, And, you know, just pretentious talk there but today I get it today more than those three I get why the passing of someone you don't even know you've never I've never met I saw him once at a distance at a comic-con but I've never met never spoke to you didn't know who I was what why 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 would that death move me at the bar I was at right before I came to this microphone to cry in my drink, to get choked up and teary and feel the need to share other people's quotes from Twitter about this gentleman. Uh, Stan Lee. Stan Lee, again, 95 years old. <coughs> Stan Lee was responsible through Massive impact. And again, you can argue, well, wasn't it Jack Kirby? Wasn't it Steve Ditko? Wasn't it Gil Kane? It was all of these people. And history is history. And no, we shouldn't ignore it. But today, I'm going to say Stan Lee built more than probably the Transformers. More than maybe George Lucas with Star Wars. Maybe. Maybe. He built the basis of me as a person. He he created something that I, as a person now, an individual who uses words to communicate and is communicating with you, and who exists in the world with an appearance, with actions, with beliefs, with thoughts, with everything that makes a human a human, (laughs) more than anything else, out there, the song titles I want to drop, the authors I want to wish I had read, the comedians who I felt speak, speak, spoke truth, speak, spoke truth. 
Stanley built the foundation, the groundwork, the world, wrote, created, told the stories, invented the characters, introduced the visuals and amazing wordplay of a world that is the world I inhabit. I'm not claiming to live in New York, at least of all the New York from Marvel Comics, nor do I live in Wakanda or Genosha or the blue area of the moon. Nor was I a World War II veteran, or World War I veteran prior to that, nor, nor did I attend a school for the gifted. I went to Emerson, it's not the same thing. Nor was I, nor was I a photojournalist, nor was I a prince, but underwater or of, of another kingdom entirely. Nor was I a gamma-radiated lawyer, you know, which I'm not sure if he created She-Hulk, but I'm putting her on the list. No, I'm, I'm talking about the world of comic books. Reading comic books, collecting comic books, knowing, enjoying, and talking about comic books. And comic books predate Stanley. He didn't write the first one. I'm not sure who wrote the first comic book. There's there's examples out there, and I, I, I should have researched or could have researched. But but you know the superhero comic books even there were plenty before him. Superman and Batman and Wonder Woman being three. Captain America wasn't his creation. That predates him. But Stanley, <clears throat> as a person, as an individual, through the mind of a through the eyes of a child who saw him. I mean, I think I first read Stanley in Stan's Soapbox, which is if you collected Marvel Comics in the 80s, you, know, you flipped to the middle of it, there was always a page that promoted upcoming, uh, it was all text, but it promoted upcoming comics and had a little, little essay that he would write it's called Stan Soapbox. Usually either he was shilling an upcoming book or just telling you how he felt. I knew that that was someone's name. I knew that it was written in the first person. I knew he was talking to me and... Soon thereafter, I, I knew what it sounded like because he started narrating cartoons. You know, he narrated Spider-Man and his amazing friends. He narrated the Incredible Hulk, Hulk cartoon. He told you he was Stan Lee, and he told you what you were about to see, and it was exciting. Stan Lee was a persona, personality, and presence of comic books in comic books about comic books. Stan Lee, more than... What, the Kevin Smith films, more than the Patton Oswalt comedy, more than the Brian Pushane stand-up, more than what they want us to think of the characters on Big Bang Theory, more than the current culture that wears this with T-shirts and Trapper Keepers and, and whatever it is so people know they're geeks. More than any of that, Stanley was the first honest-to-fuck fan of comic books that I ever encountered. He was a salesman. He was promoting Marvel, but he legitimately loved it. He got to do what he loved, we can guess, but he, he loved comic books and the characters in these comic books and the stories they told and the costumes they wore and the ridiculous dialogue they got to spout and the colorful, flashy, cosmic adventures that actually made no sense when you thought about them. He loved all of that. And he was an adult. He was already in, in his 50s when I was born. And he loved this stuff. And made no apologies about it. And made no pretension about it. Didn't hide behind it. Never, never opted to, to seem hip. To make comic books hip. And didn't have to because he was Stan fucking Lee. And we knew who he was. Think about that. Think about the fact that a six-year-old knew who a comic book publisher was. Knew who the guy behind the scenes, not the artist, because people always, I think, loved artists before writers, at least in the circles that I was in, because comics looks visual. You think visual first. Think about the fact that a six-year-old know, knew that, oh, this guy created Spider-Man. Red Steve Yitko, sure. But we're talking about Stan Lee because there's something inherently about Stan Lee. The mythology and the reality of Stan Lee. That mattered. I don't, I'm not going to speak for anyone else. I'll speak for myself. Mattered to me from age six on. 
I mean, the comics I was reading, of course I knew Spider-Man. Of course I knew the Hulk. Thanks to my brother, I got to know Thor. I got to know Iron Man. And oh my God, I got to know the X-Men a few years down the line. I knew these characters and I loved them. Doesn't mean I was reading them. I was reading other comics, you know. I, I, I was reading the, the Marvel Star Wars comics. I was reading the Transformers movie adaption or, 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 or toy adaption ca- cartoon. I, I was reading Gold Key comics about Scooby Doo or Battle of the Planets. That was probably a Whitman comic, but I wasn't nece- necessarily reading the Marvel comics. But I was reading Stan Soapbox. I would grab my brother's comics and flip through it and find Stan Soapbox and read that. And I was hearing his voice. And somehow I knew what he looked like. Somehow I knew what he looked like. Prior to the internet being a place where you type in someone's name and at least one unfortunate photo comes up, I knew what Stan Lee looked like. Probably from the cover of Sons of Origins of Marvel Comics, a, a, a precursor to graphic novels, a collection of origin stories of different Marvel characters from the 60s that my brother had. And I think he was featured on that. Or maybe from Stanley's How to Write Comics the Marvel Way, a book that demystified comic book writing while also making it this mystic art, because how did this give us Spider-Man? I think he was on the cover of that. I knew who he was. I knew the look and sound of someone, and I wanted to know. You know, it wasn't like the weird footage you see of Walt Disney. Kind of stilted. Still, I guess, awe-inspiring, but stilted because he's the businessman presenting something, you know? And it wasn't... So it wasn't that... And it wasn't the same as, you know, when you get into your teens and you start to realize, you know, what, you know, this is what Eastman and Laird look like. These are the people who gave us the Ninja Turtles. Or this is what, you know, this is what the Ramones look like. Or this, you know, this is Lou Reed. You know, it wasn't that. It was at age six and seven, this 40-something-year-old man, 50-something-year-old man was sharing with me his love for this story. Comics were a medium. And comics were a published business. And he loved them as comics. We didn't have the superhero movies we have now. I mean, there was a Superman movie. Eventually, there was a Batman movie. And down the line, we start getting Marvel movies. But even before that, even before Stanley was known to the world as this cameo that you couldn't wait for, this fanboy cameo, which I think, I don't know, I feel started with Mallrats, but I guess he was in a TV movie of The Hulk before that, Trial of the Incredible Hulk. Regardless of that, at a time in my life where comic books mattered to me, which has been my whole life, but when that was starting, there was an individual out there who shared this thought and shared it with me and shared it gleefully. Marvel Comics could tell dark stories. The X-Men were not rah-rah fun. Jean Grey's death is not an enjoyable romp, but Stan Lee could talk about it still and could still just love comics. It wasn't all solemn with the string music and the gray tones and the, the, the weight of a heavy, this is important film trailer that you know precedes and promotes most movies now, so we know that there's some weight to it. He loved this shit. And I don't say shit like it doesn't have value. I say shit where it's just like it was whacked, crazy storytelling, pulpy material. A comic book is a pulpy thing. And he loved it. He didn't mind the the, 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 the poor qual- printing quality, the staples that came out, the leaps of faith one has to make for these characters to remain ageless. The, the, the sheer fact that they're wearing spandex costumes, operating things called ultimate nullifiers, and, and battling and combating people called absorbing man and annihilus. This was all just fun to say fun to talk about. And we know this. I know this because it's how I talk in the world. I'm doing a fucking podcast week to week talking about how all this fun stuff from childhood impacts me now. But even outside of that podcast, I just love talking about this stuff. Comic books, superheroes, supervillains, superpowers, crossovers, limited series, classic stories, one shots, what if, splash pages. The Marvel Age, Marvel Fanfare, Marvel Comics Presents, Marvel Team Up, blah, blah, blah. I just love talking about this because I enjoy it. And it brings joy into me. And I want to share that joy by speaking about it. And that is what Stan Lee is, was, is. I don't know how to do this part when someone has died, but... Stanley 
Because he didn't write many comics in my lifetime. He wrote a shit ton before I was born that mean the world to the world. He did write a pretty impressive Silver Surfer story, one of my favorite stories called Parable. He wrote that. But I knew him as a personality. I knew him as a creator. And I could go back and read his stories. And I do. I have collections that I love reading of his stories. But the fact of the matter is, he had an unbridled love for this world, this medium, these characters that he could just share. He loved talking Marvel comics. Excelsior, True Believer, Striking the Poses of Spider-Man. It all can seem gimmicky, but none of us think it's gimmicky. Because this man loved it and felt no shame in it. He was an adult man. He was a millionaire. He was probably a ladies' man. He was a liberal man. He was an open-minded man. He was a mature man. He was a man who knew, you know, he was a cutthroat publisher, probably. He was a guy who knew how to fight the deadline to make a story work. He knew the tricks of the trade. He knew how to publish something. He knew the value of producing. He knew all the commercial stuff that bogs us down. But he also just loved what he fucking lived. From age 17, when he was cleaning out ink wells at his first year at Timely Comics, to this goddamn year when he turned 95... I don't know if Stanley ever had a job that wasn't in some way connected to this thing that he loved, comic books. And fuck, why wouldn't I want that? (laughs) I would love that. I don't have that necessarily, so what do I have? I have the ability, as a 43-year-old, to talk and interact and discuss and understand the world (laughs) through the filter of this thing I'm passionate about. Comic books, cartoons, superheroes. I can talk about those things because they're fun. I can talk about those things because they matter. And I can talk about those things because I didn't go to sports or politicians or real world (laughs) heroes or religious icons. I went to my folks a little bit, but mostly as a child, I went to superheroes and the stories they had, the fucking Silver Surfer, Nightcrawler, Moon Knight, Spider-Man, Storm. I went to these characters to learn about people. I loved what I learned And I translated that into being and talking and living to the point now that I've got fucking issues of Dazzler framed on my wall. And I've got a Daredevil keychain that I can play with while I'm recording. And I've got long box after long box after long box of polybagged yellowing comics that I've read multiple times when I've been sick or feeling good. And I've got a video game that pits Marvel characters against Capcom characters. And I've got more action figures. And I've got more art on the wall. And I've got more things that scream, show, and display Marvel Comics characters. That means something to me. That it becomes my language, my way of interacting. What this podcast has always been about is how is it that I can live like Stan Lee? Embracing these things that aren't childish, aren't nostalgia, aren't ridiculous. They're all three of those things. But in addition to that, they are fun and that matters. It might not be why do these things matter to me. It might just be these things are fun. And the fact that comic books and comic book characters and the stories these characters tell in these comic books are fun means something. And it's okay that it means something. And no one could have taught the world that. Except Stan Lee. You know, you can have the quippy uh, self-awareness of Kevin Smith being comic book fandom mall rats, which I loved. You can have the quippy (laughs) using comic books as a modern device thing that people like Joss Whedon and and most (laughs) sci-fi does now. Um, You know, you you, you can have 
the stand-ups like Patton and Oswalt who use it as a way of being like the nerds make good on the world. You know, you can have all of those things, and that's fine. Or you can have Stan Lee, who isn't trying to be any of these things, or isn't trying to... There's no Stan Lee movement, you know? There isn't a bunch of anyone so you could say, oh, they're doing Stan Lee. And that's not a knock. I, I, I love Kevin Smith, and there are people who wanted to be Kevin Smith, you know? And just like, I, you know, there are other people I love, and there are people who want to be them. People might want to be Stan Lee, but it's not like there's a, a, a mold of Stan Lee you can mimic because he's sincerely just Stan Lee. All you can do is if you feel that passionate about comic books the way he does, you can be that. Stanley was a salesman, sure. Stanley was probably difficult for some people who worked next to him to work with, but I've got to tell you, Stanley will be for me. And this is not with blinders. This is not even having met the man. This is because this is what he did to me. Stanley will always be the person who taught me how to just love the things I love. If there's something in pop culture I like, get it, watch it, listen to it, live it. That's fine. Be passionate about it and don't feel like you have to throw it away or grow out of it or treat it with gloves that, oh, this is nostalgia. So why does this mean to me? Just love it because some of it's silly and ridiculous and some of it is deep and social and some of it is probably not that good, but all of it is fun. And Stan Lee is... is, is on top of the person who gave us the X-Men, who gave us Spider-Man, who gave us so many iconically to look at and know characters, that it's weird to think. And this is why it's always weird, I guess, when these people, like I mentioned before, and Stanley pass away. It's like in his lifetime, he did something early on that has shaped the world, that's recognizable the world over. And he's dead. He passed on because he's mortal, like all of us. And so that's sad because it's a time when you think about Stanley's gone, you know, and it's people die, everyone dies, everything dies, and death is never easy or fun or enjoyable. And we have that weird, surreal, it's not surreal, it's the wrong use of the word, but there's an artistic benefit when artists die, because you can say you still got their work, <laughs> still got their work, and that's what you loved. You didn't know John Lennon, but here's some songs of his. <laughs> okay. And that's true. And you know, well, he hadn't written anything in a while anyway, so it's, you know, his old work. Yeah, fine. I do mourn the loss today of a human being who genuinely loved what he did. And I don't think that's common. I think it's quite rare. <laughs> I don't have it. I don't love what I do. But he did. And in seeing that, I could. You know, I do have glimpses of loving things that I do. And I also know that it's possible because he did. And the things that he loved are things I love. Some of them, comics, these characters. And there was no pretension to that. He isn't, you know, I mean, Marvel Comics, sure, he, he was a pitchman for them and the face of the company, but he loved them. His vision was going in his final couple of years. And there's a painful quote that I'm not getting right where he was talking about how his vision was going. And he's like, I can't read comics anymore. The print's too small for me. And he spread out saying, I can't read the newspaper. I can't read books. I just, I can't read anymore. And that hurt to see that quote. And that was when he was alive. Because this man loved these fantastic stories on the page. Because I love the Marvel movies, and I love Marvel toys, and I love my Dazzler, Dazzler action figure that I've got right here. Hey. 
but the medium when it's that you know the 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 original medium of comics is important and matters and that's hard that he couldn't read it anymore and that's hard that's what that is and it's hard because he's not on earth anymore he had a this is a dumb word to throw around because it's a metaphor but Stanley had a soul for pop culture had a soul had a humane soul And that's gone now. And it leaves um, in its wake, in its path, and behind it, it leaves a lot of work that people read, but a lot of feelings that people have that of joy, I guess. That's what I'm saying. Stanley had a soul and that's at the heart of um, that's at the the, the heart at the heart of, of of what matters to me with the the pop culture that I I, I look at I read the characters I like the, the movies and, and all that it's, it's just it's it, he had a soul that loved this stuff and that is missed because I learned that from him these things that matter matter and I got the acceptance that they matter from him you're missed Stanley you're already missed and uh, thank you for all of it Yeah. Thank you, Stanley. Do you have a specific target audience? Oh, just anybody who could read, anybody who's literate. Uh, it used to be, again, that comics were just for little kids, or they were thought to be for little kids. But that's changed. Uh, yeah, yeah. With Marvel, because we started directing Marvel at ourselves, really. The, th the theory was we're going to write the kind of stories we would enjoy reading, you see. And I didn't know if it would work or not, but it worked better than anybody expected because we grabbed a lot of readers who were much older, who liked the kind of things that we liked, but we didn't lose the young kids. So we ended up we have kids seven years old who read Marvel who don't understand the subtle implications and ramifications and the psychology and philosophy and the subliminal moralizing, but they love the nutty characters and the long underwear and the colorful costumes. And the older readers enjoy all the little subplots and the little asides we put in and the little things that a young kid can't ever grasp, but they're there in the story. Reached a happy medium. Yeah. So we, we find the best formula, if you call it that, is we don't try to write for any audience. We try to write stories we would enjoy. And apparently there are enough people in the world who have the same tastes. Mm -hmm.